Dave Talks Comics, episode 114, Heroes Con 2016, part 2. Welcome to Dave Talks Comics, the program where I talk about comic books, cartoons, and comic book conventions. Most episodes are a mix of summary and opinion and include spoilers. Please keep that in mind. Spoilers. All past episodes can be streamed or downloaded from the program's website, davetalkscomics.com. This episode continues my coverage of Heroes Con 2016. I will be talking about my experiences on Friday, the first day of the convention, who I talked to, panels I went to, things I bought, and so on and so forth. You can find my blog posts on HeroesCon 2011 and 2012 and podcasts on HeroesCon 2014 and 2015 at DaveTalksComics.com. Look for the name HeroesCon in the convention section on the right-hand side of the page and click it. You might have to scroll down a little bit to find it. Heroes Con 2016, day one, is over. And here are my notes. Here's, here's what I saw, what I did. Uh, first, something about the hotel. I said the hotel where I'm staying is pretty nice. It's not perfect. They're actually in the process of renovating the hotel, which might explain why I got the rate I did. I'm not sure. But it's it's very nice. I had breakfast here this morning. Uh, they have a continental breakfast. I had eggs and toast and a waffle and apple juice. And it was it was good. You know, it wasn't spectacular, but it was it was good. It certainly, you know, it filled me up and uh and it was good. Uh, after that, I got in the car and I drove to... I didn't drive downtown. I drove to the Lynx station, which is at the inner... Which is right where the Lynx ends, right at I-485. So I parked in the garage there, which there was no charge for parking in the garage. And then I took the train into into downtown Charlotte. Now, I had to wait about 15 minutes for the train to leave. There was actually a train there, but I had to wait about 15 minutes before it finally took off. And then it was like a 20, 25-minute ride, I'd say, maybe even... It was no more than a half-hour ride in. And uh, very smooth. It wasn't crowded. Let's see, it was about 9.15 when the train left, and... I'm sure we got in. It was probably after, it was probably 9.40 or something like that when the train got in. So I had to stand in line. I got my badge. I got my print, which uh, was part of one of the rewards for buying an advance pass. And I learned from prior years to have something handy to take, to to put the print in. And so I brought a sleeve this um, hard plastic sleeve to put the print in. I also picked up a poster for next year's convention, uh, advertising next year's convention, and I picked up there's another print which has all of the uh, has the floor layout on it. it. Shows where all the booths are. It doesn't have everybody's name on it, but it has the booth numbers on it. So then I had to wait in line for. Well, it should have only been about 45 minutes because I think it was about 9:45 when I got in line to get into the show. And they were supposed to open at 10.30 for people who had bought the advance passes, the advanced three-day passes. But they didn't end up letting us in till almost 11. It was like 11, uh, 10.55, 10.57, something like that. So I stood there and I read some comics. At first I was reading The Fade Out, number three. But uh, there's a, a certain amount of nudity in that comic. And there was a guy with his daughter standing behind me. And so eventually it got to the point where I was like, uh, I, I'm not too comfortable doing this. So 
I put that away, and instead I read from Marvel Unlimited, I read uh, an issue of Avengers, I think Avengers 93, which is part of the, the Kree Skrull War. Maybe it was 94, either 93 or 94. And it's a long issue. I think it's a double-sized issue, so I didn't manage to get through the whole thing. Uh, so finally we got into the show. It's If, if you've gone in first thing on, on Friday morning, you'd see that there is, it, it's very empty. I mean, not even all the tables are manned. Uh, I mean, there's a fair number of them that are manned. I'd say probably the majority of them, there's people there, but there's, there's people still setting things up. There's very few people on the floor at that point for that first half hour. And I think they held off on letting other people in. Oh, I think they were supposed to let in at 11. They held off on letting them in until 11.30. I'm not certain on that, though. So I walked around for a while, just looking at things, not looking too closely, as I usually do at first. And the first person I stopped to talk to was Tim O'Brien, who I've talked to, have met at a number of times at Heroes at, and, and at Appleseed. I don't think he's ever been to to Baltimore Comic Con or, or SPX, the Small Press Expo. Uh, but I've certainly talked to him at those other two shows. So I stopped there and chatted for maybe... 10 minutes, I'm not sure, uh, about what I was looking forward to and uh, the people I was looking to meet, the panels I was looking to go to. So eventually I moved on. Uh, I, I wandered around some more. I didn't really s- study the, the program guide in advance, so I really wasn't sure where people were set up. I had some ideas, some people I wanted to, to talk to, to buy things from, but I didn't. I didn't, uh, I kind of meandered. I didn't really, uh, I didn't even try and study it once I was at the show, let alone before the show. So the next person I talked to, his name was Corey Levine, no relative of mine. And he's a writer, and he had a book called The Bowery Boys, which is set in the mid-19th century. So this is like 1850, somewhere around there, in New York City. And it's a historical piece. It, it's an, it's, it's a graphic novel, in other words, it's fiction, but it's not, uh, there's no, um, th- th- these aren't real characters, and the, the book doesn't involve anything supernatural. It's, it's just a story about some kids in, I think teenagers, in, uh, in New York City in the 1850s. And we talked quite a bit, and it was an interesting conversation. I mean, probably for 10 minutes or so. And I asked him a lot of questions about, you know, influences and the things he's worked on and uh, things he's, um, uh, you know, whether this was part of a series or not and, you know, what else they might do. And and nothing's coming to mind as far as things we've talked about. But he seemed nice. And this book apparently is, I think it's being published I think it was published last year, actually, through Dark Horse, and I believe it is available online. It's called The Bowery Boys, B-O-W-E-R-Y. The next person I talked to was Luke Foster, and uh, what caught my eye at his table was he had a couple of uh, commissions, I think they were, of Rick and Morty, the the cartoon, which uh, I've only seen the first season, but I really loved it. And so we, I stopped there, and uh, I talked to him for a little while uh, about web comics and his comics. Um, and he, you know, he told me a little bit about his stuff. He had a few books there. I didn't buy anything from him, uh, but I did take a, a, a bookmark. I think it was a bookmark or a business card. I think. Uh, and then right across the aisle from him, uh, there was another guy. His name, his first name was Klaus. I didn't catch the last name, and I I looked in the program guide, but I couldn't find it. And that may be because he wasn't. I don't think he was the one who registered for the show. I think he's with a, I think it was a publisher who registered for the show. So I'm not sure if I'll even find his name in the program guide, even if I can find the studio, which figure out which studio it is. I'm, I doubt that I could find him. But we talked about stuff and. He was working on a book that is about a character who does not have superpowers in a world with superpowered people. Uh, superheroes, supervillains, I guess. Those 
sorts, although I'm not sure if it was as black and white as superheroes and supervillains. And this is something that's this is something that's not complete, something that he's working on. And he's the artist. And when he mentioned that the, the comic book had was the, the main character was somebody who didn't have superpowers, I asked him if he had read Love Fights. Which is a which was a comic book that Andy Watson did. That's A N D I. Although it, it, Andy Watson is a man, and uh, I've read a number of his comics. Love Fights is probably my favorite, but Love Fights is a it's a romance set in a romance between a couple people. I think one of them's an artist, and the other one's in 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 the news industry. I think I think she's a columnist or something like that. And it's a world which has superheroes, and they're kind of caught in the middle of all that. And and then his cat gets superpowers. And it was done by Oni Press. I don't know if it's still in print anymore. I'm not sure how hard it is to find. There was two. It was collected into two volumes. There were like digest-sized volumes. And it's it's very good. I should probably go back and reread it. But I recommended it to him, or I, I mentioned it to him, and he seemed eager. He wrote it down and. Uh, he was taking email addresses for people who were interested in his comics, so I gave him my email address so he could he could email me or he, I could be on his you know his email blast when he when something is ready. Um, the next place I stopped, wandered around some more. At this point, I had gone through most of Artist Alley, and I started to go through some of the areas where the dealers were, or or go through them slowly. And I stopped at one table, and I noticed this guy had comics for, it was Leroy Harper Comics, and he had comics for, I think it was two, three, and five dollar comics, a a few boxes of them. And one of the first things I spotted when I looked in the box was some issues of Batman Family, in particular Batman Family number 17. And that caught my eye. And I I didn't decide to buy it immediately, but I did eventually end up buying it. And it's this it's this great issue which has uh if you look up the cover for Batman Family seventeen, it's got Batman and Batgirl and Robin and Huntress and Man Bat on the cover. And the the cover was done by Mike Kaluta. And it's a beautiful cover. I'd seen the cover before, and it wasn't on my list of comics to buy, but it's in it's in pretty good shape. I mean, it's not in perfect shape, but it's in pretty good shape, and it was only two dollars, so I I I couldn't resist it. Uh, if for the cover, if nothing else, the the first story is a Batman and Robin story, and it's drawn by Jim Aparo. And let's see, what's this called? Is it? I'm not sure what the title of the first story is, but the I th- I I think this can be read as one big story. This whole issue, but this is a eighty-page giant. And the second story is a. Let's see. Let me get this straight. It's a Batgirl, Batwoman, Huntress story. I believe it's set on Earth One. So it's, of course, the Batman Family comic book came out in the. 1970s. So this is still at the time where there was Earth 1 and Earth 2 and Earth 3. And I don't remember exactly when Earth S came to be, if that was once the uh, the, the, the Fawcett comics were adopted into the DC universe after DC bought out Fawcett. I'm not certain. But, uh, but Huntress was, of course, from Earth 2 back in those days. And Catwoman or, or Batwoman and Batgirl were both, of course, Earth One, because on Earth Two, the Huntress was basically the Batgirl of Earth Two. She was the daughter of, well, not the daughter of Commissioner Gordon, like like Batgirl is, but she was the daughter of of uh, of, of of Batman and Catwoman on Earth Two, and the villains in this are are Catwoman. And poison ivy and somebody else. I'm not sure if I know who this this villain is. If it's Cersei, or if it is somebody else. Madame Zodiac. That's who it is. Hmm. And this one's drawn by Don Heck. Um, 
and it is written by Bob Rosakis. Let's see, the writer on the first story was Jerry Conway, and Jim Aparo was the artist, yeah. And then the third story is a, a man bat and the demon teaming up. And this one is drawn by, I want to say this is Mike Kaluta. No, Michael Golden. Michael Golden drew this one. And this one was also written by Bob Rosakis. And so I'm looking forward to reading this. This is, And he actually had more issues of, of Batman Family, but I decided just to get this one uh, in part for the cover. And... Uh, Oh, and then the other comic book that I bought from him, which was also $2, I just could not resist this, was, wait a minute, where did I put it down? It's, oh, there it is. Is DC Special Number 5, which is The Secret Lives of Joe Kubert. And basically what it is, is you get a, a some reprints of, there's some, there is a little bit of new material in here, but for the most part, it's reprints of Silver Age stories. There's a a Viking Prince story in here. There's a Hawkman story in here, which I had read before, which is also in that Hawkman collection of the Kaniger and Kubert Hawkman collection that I talked about way back on uh, probably something like episode 37 or somewhere around there. I think it was an episode in the 30s, maybe an episode in the 40s of this podcast. So there's a, there's a Viking Prince story in here. There's a, a Hawkman story. There's a Sergeant Rock story. And then there's another story involving an, an American Indian. I don't... But I, I, it wasn't a character that I recognized. And I think that was... And then there was li- other little bits in there. So um, so th- this was... And, and I, I love this cover. I think I'd seen this cover before. This was another thing that was not on my list of things that I wanted to buy. But it was something that I'd seen before. And at the price of $2, I probably will not be able to find this elsewhere uh, that inexpensive. I think that I had looked for it on, what's that website, on Comic Collectors Live. But I I think they wanted considerably more than that. Uh, At least the people who had it for sale. It was not an issue that that, that there was a lot of, um, it was kind of scarce. And this copy is not in perfect shape. There was a big fold on the... The front cover was folded over, so there's a huge crease on the cover. But for the most part, the cover... Or or the comic book is in really good shape. One of the people that I wanted to meet at this show was Daniel Warren Johnson. And I might have mentioned it on the last episode, but I just found out last night that he was going to be at Heroes Con, that he, I'd seen a tweet from him that he was going to be at Heroes Con, and I hadn't heard anything about this before. I don't think I'd really looked, but I hadn't heard anything about this before. So I, I, I had gone all through Artist Alley and had not spotted him, so I did something I rarely do, which is I went to the information desk and asked uh, where I could find him. And at first they didn't seem to be able to help me, but then one of the other people, um, the first two people I talked to didn't seem to be able to help me, but then one of the others chimed in, and she had found him. Apparently he was listed under his middle name, Warren. Uh, so he was listed under the W's instead of under the J's. But, uh, so they pointed me in the right direction, so I headed over there, and I had to wait a couple minutes because he was talking to somebody, but I got to chat with him for a few minutes, and I bought a copy of Space Mullet, which is what brought him to my attention. I had seen uh, an ad for Space Mullet, I think through Project Wonderful, on another web comics page. And I saw this ad, and it just sounded like something cool. And so I clicked on it, and then I started... I think he had just started it. I think he was just a few pages into it at that point. I'm pretty sure he was still in the first chapter. So I went back and I read the whole thing and then I and then I stuck with it and I continued to read it. Now it's been on hiatus for a while at this point and I've I think I stopped reading it at one point not because I had a problem with it but because I just wasn't reading web comics at one point. I just it was uh just one more distraction and I kind of eliminated it temporarily. 
so I bought the, the trade of the first four or five chapters of Space Mullet. And he and and then he he also did a mini comic recently, a Star Wars based mini comic called Green Leader, and so I bought that also, which I may have read online. I didn't think that I had, but when I started to look through it, it's and it's not very long; it's only like eight or ten pages. When I started to look through it, it looks familiar, so it's possible that I read this before. But I wanted it, and um, and he did he did little sketches in both of them for me. Uh, you know, it wasn't like requests, but uh, although he did ask me in the Green Leader which kind of ship uh, I wanted him to sketch, and of course I picked the X-Wing, and he was like, oh yes, old school, I understand, (laughs) which I thought was pretty cool. Um, So after that, I think I think I was about ready for lunch at that point, so my original plan was to go to Lola's. Uh, so I looked them up just to, because I was checking to see when they closed, and that's when I found out that they were closed temporarily until July. So I didn't go to Lola's for lunch. Instead, I ended up going to another place that I had not been to before called Mortimer's Pub and Bar, and I had a and I had a Sam Adams, and I had a panini there, a black and blue panini, which I think had chicken and chicken and um, uh, bacon on it I think and and I got a side of potato salad with that and I had a did I say I had a Sam Adams already maybe I did but so that was my lunch and it actually was raining when I left the convention center not real hard so I, I brought a rain jacket with me so I put that on Although by the time I left the uh, Mortimer's, it was it had stopped raining, and that was like three blocks maybe from the convention center, maybe four, but it wasn't a long walk, maybe you know ten minute walk at most I'd say. Um, and they they got me my food pretty quickly, so I wasn't gone that long. I think I was back by one thirty, maybe one forty five, maybe it was one thirty when I left the pub. I'm not sure. So I got back. Uh, I thought that the first panel I wanted to go to was at 2.30, but when I got back, I checked, and it was at 3.30. So I had like two hours to kill. So I started going through some... I started doing some bin diving. And I found this this um, uh, retailer, this uh, comic book dealer, <laughs> who just had way too many comics that I was looking for. I ended up buying 13 comics, and they were a dollar a piece. I ended up buying 13 comics from this dealer, uh, Cavalier Comics, and I almost bought considerably more than that. I just, I kept, you know, I would find like one issue, and I'd be like, well, okay, well, if they have all, if they have like these four that I'm looking for, then I'll buy all of them, or these six that I'm looking for, then I'll buy all of them, and then they would have all of them, you know, and I didn't, I didn't want to buy a ton of comics, so... I limited myself to 13, and let's see, I bought five issues of Captain America to help fill in the holes in my collection from 261 to 300, or 300 or 301 maybe, but, uh, so I bought issues 279, 294, 296, 298, and 299, I'm not sure what that brings me down to, but I'm pretty sure it's less than 10 issues at this point, that I'm missing from that run. And honestly, at this point, it's kind of a collector's thing. I, wanna, I want to own these issues, because I'm pretty sure these issues are available through Marvel Unlimited. Uh, but I want to own the physical copies, so this, which is a little unusual for me. Usually, especially with the Marvel stuff, now that I've got the Marvel Unlimited, at least for now, uh, I'm content to just read these things, but this is a little different. Uh, let's see, what else did I get? So that was five of the 13 comics that I bought. Uh, oh, I found this Silver Age romance comic in there called Falling in Love. And it was Falling in Love number 50, which was from, let's see, May of 1962? Yes, May of 1962. It's got three stories in it. Uh, it was the only issue of Falling in Love that they had 
in the, in the dollar bin. It's not in great shape. It's kind of beat up, but it's intact. It's legible. It's got these great ads on the back for all of DC's uh, romance books at that time. Girls Romances, Falling in Love, Secret Hearts, Girls Love, and Heart Throbs. So, uh, I, some of these, I, I honestly, this is, I think this is the first and the only Silver Age romance comic that I own. I, I did buy a collection called, uh, Love, is it Rom- Oh, Romance Without Tears? I think that's what it's called, which I read years ago, well before I started this podcast, maybe three or four years before I started this podcast, which I enjoyed, and, uh, so, so that was another thing I bought. Uh, I also picked up the first three issues, and I can't remember when I talked about this, but I know that I talked about Black Hawk not too long ago. Um, well, th- there was the episodes where I talked about Black Hawk, but then I think I talked about Black Hawk on the podcast, but I can't remember what it was in reference to. I think I was talking about Howard Chaikin for some reason, and one of the things that, uh, although this is this, these issues of Black Hawk that I bought today weren't done by Chaikin, but he, he did do a, a small run on Black Hawk, and I believe he's done some covers for Black Hawk, even when he wasn't writing or drawing the interiors. So this was a run from issue 251 to, I think, 273, that was from the early 80s. It was... 23 issues, I guess. And so this is the first three issues from that run. Uh, Another thing I bought, the first three issues of Dakota North. Dakota North is a female PI who appeared in Brubaker's run on, of uh, Daredevil, Ed Brubaker's, Brubaker and Lark, I think it was. Uh, Their run on Daredevil. And Daredevil had a, a fling with her at one point, and I thought she was a character that had been created for this. I, I certainly didn't realize that she had her own... Well, when I read the Daredevil run, Brubaker's Daredevil run, you know, several years ago, I didn't realize that she had had her own comic, and then I did some digging around at one point, and I found out about this. So this is something that had been on my list for some time, just like the Black Hawk comics did, just like the Captain America comics, the Falling in Love comic, no, that was not on my list of things I wanted to buy. And then finally, the only other thing I bought was an issue of an Eclipse comic called New America. And I just got turned on to this recently. This is a mini-series. It's four issues, but they only had the first issue. Otherwise, I would have bought the other issues as well. it's it's a four issue miniseries that was written by John Ostrander and Kim Yale, and I believe it's the first thing that Kim Yale worked on, at least as a writer. I'm not sure if she did any work in any other capacities. Uh, but John Ostrander was on the Word Balloon podcast recently, and that got me thinking about he he was talking about his current wife. Kim Yale was his wife back in the '90s. She died of, I'm not sure what she died of, but she died young. I believe she was in her 30s or maybe 40s. I, I think she was in her like her late 30s when she died. And she had worked with him on, on she'd done some work with him on Grimjack, on Suicide Squad, on, on New America, and on some other comic books too. I don't think her run on comic books was very long. I'm not entirely sure what her background was, but I got curious the other night after listening to this this podcast with uh, with with John Ostrander, and so I, I looked her up on Comic Book DB, and this was the first thing, the first credit that she had was New America, and so I because I found it, I decided I would buy it, uh, and I believe this this is spun out of the Scout comic book, which I've never read, and I don't own any issues from, so I'm not sure how connected it is to the Scout comic book series. I'm sure it's connected in some way, but uh, I'm not sure if I would be able to recognize it just from reading New America, where the, in fact, I'm sure I wouldn't be able to figure out what the 
the connections are, considering I don't even really know anything about the Scout comic book. After finally settling on those 13 comics from Cavalier Comics, and there was a number of things that I picked out and almost put in my pile, or started to put in my pile and then put back. Uh, I went back to the O'Brien's table, and I, John was there at this point, so John and Tim and I talked a little bit, and I showed them the stuff that I'd gotten up to that point. And, let's see, I still hadn't gone to a panel yet. Uh, so after talking to them for a little while, then I walked around a little longer, and I wound up at this guy's table. His his artist's name is Great House, which I believe he told me was his is his last name. I'm not sure what his first name is, but that's what his banner said. It just said Great House. And it's it's one word, Great House. And he had a few prints, and he had a couple of interesting prints that he he'd just done a few copies of. And one was of Daredevil and Electra. And what he had done was he did like fifteen copies of it. And that's all he had for sale. And I think they were like forty dollars a piece but as an added bonus, he also had sketches on each one of them that he'd already done, and each sketch was different. So each poster would have a different sketch. And I think they were like head sketches, but it was really nice work. And But what he, the other thing he, oh, that, so that was the Daredevil and Electra print. He also had a Bruce Lee print, which was similar to those. In the, I think he only had like nine copies of the Bruce Lee print, and once again, selling it for $40.00. Uh, and it includes a a custom sketch on the print in a I guess an area where there's nothing or an empty space in in the print. And then he had a ten dollar print, which was of Samurai Jack, and it was specifically of the. Hold on, let me look at it. It was specifically of episode seven, season one, episode seven, Jack and the Three Blind Archers, which is one of my favorite episodes and there's there's three images and uh one is of jack hiding behind a tree and another is of that warrior uh chieftain who shows up at the beginning of the episode well yeah he shows up at the beginning of the episode who who had led a robot army to try and take that the, the tower in jack and the three blind archers and then the final image is of the the three blind archers and I really love that episode, and we got to talking about it, and I wasn't going to get it, and, well, I, I don't know. You know, sometimes you just enjoy talking to somebody, and they've done something, and it's, it, it's, it's, if you just saw it, you might not buy it, but because you talk to them and you make that personal connection, you, you want to spend the money, you want to support them. And so, and it's a nice print. Don't get me wrong. It's a nice print. I'm not. I don't feel like I was. It was. It was charity in in, in any respect for me to buy this. I I, I really do like it. Um, but I, if I had just walked past and hadn't asked him anything about it, I you know I might have just kept going and not picked it up. But because I stopped and talked, I ended up buying something. It doesn't always work out that way, but it, it certainly did in this case. I think it was at this point that I finally went to the first panel, and I'm going to talk about that a little later. And that was the the um, the Ren and Stimpy panel. Yes, yeah, and that was a lot of fun. But I will talk about that in a little bit. In but and then after that panel, I had an hour until the next panel I was going to go to, and in that time, I went back down to the floor. I wandered around a little more. Uh, I wound up at another dealer's table who had 50-cent comics. I ended up digging through those bins. And I bought five more comics. Uh, one of them was something to fill in a hole in my collection, and that was the Twilight comic, which is was a three-issue. This is not related to the whole vampire Twilight thing. The This is the... I. I think it was at Heroes Con last year, or it was at Baltimore, one of the two. I picked up the second and third issues in this miniseries. This is a prestige format miniseries from, I believe, the early 90s. It was written by Howard Chaikin and drawn by Jose Luis Garcia Lopez. And this, uh, so I bought the first two, or the, the second and third issues last year. 
and but I didn't have the first issue, and I found it this year. So I picked that up, um, and I just continued to look through the bins. I should have just stopped there. But for two more dollars, I also got the Vigilante City Lights Prairie Justice miniseries, which they had all of it. Uh, I saw something else which I almost picked up, and I might go back and try picking it up if they still have it. Um, they were missing one issue. If they hadn't been missing that one issue, I might have picked it up. Uh, and that was the Terminal City um, miniseries. Actually, there's two miniseries of Terminal City, which I've never read, but it was, I believe, written by Dean Motter and drawn by Michael Lark, I think. I think it was Lark. And they just had a piece in, in um, on Comics Should Be Good blog about this. And that got my interest in this. And I like Michael Lark's art. Although this is early in his career, and it really doesn't look like his work like on Daredevil, which I like very much, but I also like the look of this. And they had the, the first series with nine issues, and they were missing issue nine. They had the first eight. And the second series was five issues, and they did have all of those. And I believe it's available in a trade. I should really look up and see how much the the digital copy would cost me. I I think it... it well, let's see. If these were 50 cents a piece, then for eight and five is 13. So that would be about $7 for the entire thing. I'm pretty sure that's less than what I would pay for it, unless maybe it was on sale. But normally I think that's less than I would pay for the electronic copy. i got to believe it was at least $10 for the electronic, and it may have been more like 12 or 15 or even 20 maybe. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm just not sure. But I don't think there was anything else at that. And that was Acme Comics. Um, but I may go back there and wander around some more. I don't know. Um, See what else I can find. There or other dealers' tables. There may be some more dealers who have really good deals on old comics, on 50 cents, or dollar comics, or two dollar comics. One of the things I found at Leroy Harper Comics that I didn't buy was a copy of Steal the Indestructible Man number one. Now, I have that issue, but it's really beat up. And I wanted a better copy, but he wanted $5 for the first issue. And I just, I, I'm pretty sure I can get it for less than that online, even with shipping costs. If I buy a bunch of comics, I'm pretty sure I can get it for less than $5 online. And the copy I have, I can read. I just, I want a better copy for my collection. That's all it is. So, after, oh yeah, and then I was going to, I was headed to the panel, the second panel, which was the reprints panel. But, uh, I, and I was really making a beeline out of there, and I heard somebody call my name, and I turned around, and it was Adam and Sean Doughty from, from the Dollar Bin. And so, they were going to panels. I think they both had had panels that they were that they were doing uh, that they were moderating individually they so against each other um, and so we talked for a couple minutes and I told them a little bit about the the Ren and Stimpy panel and one thing that I learned was that Adam wasn't taping any of the panels that they were doing this year so maybe I should go to one of the Tyler Pence panels or, or one of the panels that Sean or Adam are moderating this year since they're not going to be available online. Um, so there wasn't a whole lot of time left until the panel, so uh, they went their way, I went mine, and I will talk about the reprints panel in a little bit, but that basically was the rest of my time at the show was spent at the reprints panel. So after that, you know, I used the bathroom, and then I, I took off, I... I took the links back to the to the end of the line to I-485. I got my car, and after uh, I, I, I stopped briefly to put some gas in the in the tank because it was getting very low, and uh, I made a pit stop at the back here at the hotel, and then I went to dinner 
ha- uh, had dinner at um, a place close to the hotel, a couple miles from the hotel, called Tamarind Fine Cuisine of India. I had the, the methi chicken and some naan, and it was very good. It was very good. Was it the, the very best Indian food I've ever had? No, I don't know, but it was, it was fresh tasting, and it was good food. The spices were good. It did not taste old or like it had been sitting around or anything like that. It, it, it was, and I asked for it medium spicy, and I, I think what I got was probably medium spicy. And, um, and then on the way home from, on the way back to the hotel, I stopped at 7-Eleven and bought a haagen chocolate-covered ice cream bar. Which, I don't know, I probably didn't need, but I felt like having something like that. So, um, And that's basically my day, other than my, my descriptions of the two panels, which I will do in a little bit. Okay, I think I've blabbed on long enough about today, but I, just, I have to say something about these panels. Uh, they were both good. They were very different. Uh, one was very cerebral, and the other was very energetic and lots of fun. Uh, but I thought that they were both excellent in their own way. Uh, the one that was energetic and a lot of fun was the uh, was the Ren and Stimpy panel. And the Ren and Stimpy panel basically consisted of, well, they had one guest and a moderator. Uh, the, the guest was Bob Camp, who was the co-creator of Ren and Stimpy. And he told a lot of stories. Oh, I, I should start off by talking about how he came into the, the room. He came into the room and he grabbed the microphone before he sat down, or maybe as he sat down, he grabbed the microphone. And before the moderator could say anything, he said, okay, jump in as soon as you know what we're doing. And then he started singing a song. And it was, if you know Ren and Stimpy, it was the log song. And it took me about 10 or 15 seconds to remember exactly what it was, because I have not watched Ren and Stimpy in quite some time. But I do remember the log song, and although I don't remember all the words, I was able to join in on some of my favorite lines, you know. Uh, What's great is a snack and fits on your back. It's log, it's log. <laughs> it's better than bad, it's good. <laughs> it's wood, it's wood. But uh, so that's how he began it, and he, you know, there was times he he told some great stories throughout this panel. He started off by, actually, I don't think it was, I'm not sure if he or if it was the moderator, who who talked about uh, some of his background and things like in animation, his background work and things like the real Ghostbusters and Thundercats and Tiny Toon Adventures. Uh, this is all before working on Ren and Stimpy, I think. Um, and some of his comic book work on things like The Nom and G.I. Joe and Conan, and they named a bunch of other comics. And I did tape this panel, and hopefully the audio comes out good. I haven't, I've only listened to a couple little bits of it. But um, the thing was that Bob got very loud at some points. So I'm not sure how that's going to affect the audio the impact of the audio, you know, and he had a microphone, so he didn't need to, but he got very loud at some points, which made very entertaining, but, um, so, I mean, he got questions, that, he took both questions from the audience, and questions from the moderator, whose name, I think, was Joe Rosh, or Rock, R-A-U-S-C-H, I believe, who I think, I'm not sure what his, I, I want to say he works for Heroes, but I'm not certain if that's correct. Um, but, you know, he asked him about... He, it opened with, with Joe asking Bob a number of questions about it, like, when did you know it was big? Uh, you know, Ren and Stimpy was a big thing. Uh, what was the legacy of Ren and Stimpy? And I think the answer to that question basically was that... The legacy was that cartoons don't have to be educational. And the kids are smarter than we think they are. Um, but he talked about a lot of things. I mean, he actually referenced a number of episodes of Ren and Stimpy. I, I couldn't remember any of these episodes. I'm sure if I started watching them, and I believe it is available on Hulu, 
if if I started watching them, I would it would bring back memories. I I have no idea how much of the original run of the show I watched. I remember watching this in the in the early to mid '90s, and uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, one of the things that Joe Joe brought up was uh, classic Hollywood influences on the cartoon, and Bob definitely agreed with that. And he he cited a number of things: Buster Keaton, Fatty Arbuckle, The Three Stooges, Abbott and Costello, Mad Magazine. Warner Brother cartoons, you know, things like the Merry Melodies and uh, the Bugs Bunny, Daffy Duck, those sorts of things. Harvey Kurtzman, he talked about Droopy. Um, he talked about the underground comics of Robert Crumb. So he talked about a number of things, a number of influences and how in different ways they influenced his sensibilities, I guess. I'm not 100% sure I'm remembering that correctly, but... Uh, like I said, the the big thing about this panel, it was just so unbelievably energetic. Um, he also talked about some of the some of the things that he thought were very important to the cartoon, and it did make it work because uh, I think, like a lot of things that become a hit, it it's, it's to a certain degree, it's a matter of when it it just it, there's a certain amount of luck that you're doing the right thing at the right time. And I can't remember if he said anything like that, but I, I I personally believe that. But some of the things he did talk about was the amount of irony in the show, and that he felt that irony was a key element in the show. Um, he talked about, oh, and timing, you know, the importance of timing. And, and, and he talked about how, you know, scripts and how he doesn't like these full scripts for cartoons, how he feels like, you know, you need an outline, but that most of the work, you know, I think, I think what he had a problem with was that it felt like to him that after a point, the, the writing became too big a part of the show and there wasn't enough left for the animators to do, uh, enough free will for them to do. They were being given two explicit instructions and, and and that's something that he he doesn't believe is 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 a good way to to run an animation uh, an animation uh, show an animated show. Um, he told a great story about how he, they wanted to use a line that used the the, the term jock itch in it, and they couldn't the the the, the powers that be at Nickelodeon. Uh, wouldn't let them use the term jock itch. And so he, after thinking about it for a while, he came back and said, well, how about hemorrhoids? And they didn't have a problem with him using hemorrhoids on a cartoon. So that was uh, that was a good story. And honestly, you have to listen to the listen to him tell the story on the, um, on, on the recording, which I will post. Um, it's just, uh, provided it came out, you know, even semil... Uh, semi-audible because it's it's entirely in the way he tells it. There's no way that uh, what I'm telling you here and, and just not in the way he told that story but just the way he conducted himself at this panel. It was just uh, amazing. Um, he talked about working with, with Bruce Tim a little bit. Not not too much. I mean he, he just had one brief story about working with Bruce Tim and he talked about the influence of Ralph Bakshi, another uh, animator on this this cartoon, on Ren and Stimpy. Uh, there was some discussion, there were some questions from the audience about the differences between the DVD and the broadcast versions of Ren and Stimpy. And he didn't really... I mean, one of the things he said in response to that was that they never consulted him on the DVD versions. He didn't know that there was going to be a DVD version until he saw it in a video store. Um, and that he he doesn't get really wrapped up in the differences between the DVD versions and the broadcast versions. And, I mean, there was some discussion, there were some questions about, you know, 
what what are some of the things that they would that you couldn't get away with that they wouldn't and that's where the jock itch story I believe came from. But he seemed to think that being pushed at, at least at one point in this panel he he indicated being pushed you know getting pushed back from Nickelodeon actually he felt made him more creative and he he doesn't seem bitter about some of the changes that were made um or the pushback that he got from the fr- from the um from the network I guess uh and he he described himself and this is the term he used he described himself as a turd polisher and uh that that that's been his job that he comes in and he takes something that's really looks ugly and he makes it beautiful and uh and he 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 apparently teaches a lot of classes these days and he says he's he always is telling his students to be honest that that's the most important thing as an artist is to be honest and that art is power and then he got into a little bit of discussion of politics there was some discussion of Donald Trump and what he might do if Donald Trump wins the election or what he's thinking about doing just because Donald Trump is in the election and but it, on the whole it was just so much fun he was talking for about 50 minutes well you know answering questions and responding to the audience and responding to questions from Joe and it was just it was my first panel of the convention and it was just such a wonderful panel i just i can only hope that the other panels that i go to will turn out to be as good as this one the second and final panel of the day and the final thing that i did at heroes con today was i went to the the comic reprints panel and this was a bigger panel as far as the number of people up there talking to the audience although it was not a very big audience i think there was maybe 15 20 people in the audience they had a had a decent sized room actually a bigger room than they had for the 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 Ren and Stimpy panel which i think was i think was packed uh they probably about a, double the, the size double the space for this panel and so the four people who were on this panel were well it was moderated by Andy Mansell who I've seen a number of times at these panels sometimes as a moderator sometimes as a guy who's just running around uh making sure all the panels are are starting on time and functioning and everything's is running good uh but he moderated it and then the four guests that they had on the panel were Craig Yo of Yo Publishing and that's Y O E Craig Fisher who of uh who's written for the Comics Journal and is a professor somewhere I'm not sure um uh Michael Yuri who work who is the I think the editor I think that's his title of Back Issue magazine and I've seen him I've also seen Craig Fisher before on a number of these panels Craig Yo this is the first time that I'd seen him but uh Michael Yuri works for Back Issue magazine which is published by Two Morrows and I've seen him on panels before and then there's uh oh and the other one was Tom Hightjes who have also seen on a panel before I think a few years ago I think that panel is up on my website the the recording of that panel on the comics press or something like that from 2012 I think it was 2012 maybe it was 2014 you know what I think it was 2014 yeah I'm pretty sure it was 2014 so So they had a discussion about comic reprints. Now it ended up being a discussion in large part about comic strip reprints. There was a little bit of discussion of comic book reprints, but there was a lot of discussion of comic strip reprints. And Andy kind of ran the panel. He he asked uh I think there was three questions and I didn't write all of them down. But I think the first question was about how you go about collecting material. Do you try and collect everything or do you start by doing or do you just do a best of? Do you just selectively collect things? Uh or do do you, is the plan to collect it all but you start with the good stuff so you wet people's appetite and then you bring in the other stuff, you know, then you fill in is the I think the way that they described it. 
Uh, and there was a lot of good discussion on this, you know, on um, what, you know, what do you, co- what, what do you collect, what don't you collect, and Craig Yo had some impact about, had some input on this, talking about his efforts to get Paul Levitz to reprint Sugar and Spike, which was a, a comic book um, feature. I don't think it had its own, it might have had its own comic book, but I think it was a comic book feature back in the Golden Age. And apparently Paul Levitz was a very big proponent of the, when he was the, and I can't even remember exactly what his title was, he was not the publisher, I don't know if he was the managing editor of DC Comics, uh, or the, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what Paul Levitz's title was. I know I've I've looked that up at some point when I was researching his work on the Legion of Superheroes for my Legion, my coverage of the the Great Darkness Saga, which he wrote. I I, I knew what that was, but I, I can't think of it right now. But they talk, for instance, about the Plastic Man reprints and how. And I, which I have the first volume of, but I think they did, they said they they've done eight of them, but they stopped doing them, and they'd only gotten up to about 1947. And somebody I I can't remember if it was in the audience or on the panel said something like, "Well, it didn't really get good until like the early 50s, so they stopped a few years prior to where they should have." And will they ever start publishing it again? And if they do, what are they going to do? Are they going to go back to the beginning and start from the beginning again? Or, you know, how will they go about that? Uh, and so there was a certain amount of discussion of that, of how important is it, especially with things, you know, continuity. Uh, comic strips where continuity is very important or integral part of the comic book. How important is it to, to start at the beginning and publish all the way through? Or can you just publish, like, a chunk of the comic strip or the comic book and is that good enough? What What's the best approach? That's what they were trying to get at in this, in this section of the conversation. Uh, there was also a question about extras in reprints. In other words, those essays that would show up in these collected editions. How, how important are they? How much do they, how much value do they add to these things? And, and then there was some discussion of how some of the collections, while the, the material that's collected in them is great, there's almost nothing, or there is nothing, in the way of additional material. And one of the prime examples of that was Peanuts. They have collected decades worth of the Peanuts comic strip at this point, and I, I'm completely unaware of this because I don't own any of those, I haven't read any of those. But apparently there is no extra materials in those. It's just the comic strips. And there's no commentary, there's no criticism, you know, literary criticism of them or articles about them, which seems a little strange to some people. Some people would really like to see that kind of thing in there. And it was pointed out that some comic strips and comic books really need to have, and this is a quote, and I believe this was Tom Heinches who said this, need to have some, some strips need to have the table set for the reader. In other words, you're not going to be able to understand it unless you know the context from which it came. As with a lot of things that are published, or not just published, but movies, possibly this could apply to music, but certainly plays, performances. When you see something from another decade, from 50 years ago, 100 years ago, there are some things which are timeless, and there are some things that... some pieces of art that are timeless and some pieces of art that are not timeless. And the ones that are not timeless or that are in a heavy way not timeless, you probably need somebody to explain to you what it is you're seeing, and the relevance of it. Because sometimes you think you understand what you're reading or seeing or experiencing, but you don't know the context from which it came. And society has changed for the better, for the worse, but society has changed 
and without it's it's not that you can't read it and you can't get something out of it but if you, if you don't know the context from which it came it can be it can be a real turn off sometimes and i think that's what he was getting at he talked about this one particular comic book and i cannot i did not write down the title for this i have not gone back and listened to my recording of this panel but he talked about one comic book in particular which had a very racist caricature in it and i can't remember if it was the main character or a supporting character there was a very racist caricature in it and he felt that something like that really needed to have some sort of an introduction for the reader so that the reader not to excuse what's in the comic strip or the comic book whichever it was but to explain the context in which it came from and how in some ways maybe it was progressive for its time in comparison to other comic books and comic strips at that time. And I'm not 100% certain that it was. I, don't even, I can't even remember what the comic strip or comic book was that he was talking about, but this was his point. And I think, I think there's a lot to that. that. And I've probably gone on about this for too long. But I didn't take extensive notes during this 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 panel. I, I started to take notes. I took considerably fewer notes than I did during the the Ren and Stimpy panel. One of the last things in my notes that I've got are and there's a few things here was a discussion of some of the things that hold back the publication of some of these reprints why aren't some of these things being reprinted and one thing that, that that Craig Yo brought up was the was that the print runs really aren't that big for a lot of these collections that quite often it's 2,000 you know on a good day and on a great day maybe 3,000 and when I say great day I mean a great print run maybe 3,000 copies are printed but normally, you know, a, a good print run is is about 2,000 copies. You know, when you compare that to some of these books and comic books where you're talking tens or hundreds of thousands, it's considerably smaller. Translations is another thing for foreign comic books that holds back some of these things from getting reprinted. In addition to the willingness of creators to, to have their material reprinted, some Creators don't like some of their early material or don't like particular sections of their work and don't want it reprinted. And then there was a, a few questions about the quality of reprints and you know what is a true reprint and is there such a thing as a true reprint? You know, uh, Some questions about recoloring things using today's coloring processes versus yesterday's coloring processes and on the whole anyway this was a great panel this was a fascinating panel it was a much nerdier panel than the other panel I went to a much more intellectual panel the other, than the other one I went to uh, it did get me interested in some of the books from Yo Publishing and I actually did go by their table today before this panel not immediately before but before this panel I think I stopped a couple times and flipped through some of their books and I might pick something up from them tomorrow. I'm not sure. It'll depend on how much they cost. And I think they do have some things available through Comixology. But a couple things that got me interested were there was a, a Don Heck horror collection and there's also a Jack Cole horror collection. So I'll, I'll see. I'll see. But uh, this, this was an excellent panel. They've got another panel coming up that I'm not sure if I'm going to go to which is on the comics canon. And the reason why I probably wouldn't go to that is because I'm not sure I 100% believe in the idea of a comics canon. But anyway, I, I, I'm, I'm going on too long. So that was it for the comic reprints panel on day one of Heroes Con. That's it for episode 114 of Dave Talks Comics. But my coverage of Heroes Con 2016 continues in episode 115, where I will be talking about day two of the convention. 
I'm Dave. Thank you for listening.